Hello, welcome to this presentation on the ancient Roman city of Ephesus on the west coast of Turkey. What I'd like to do is take you on a little bit of a visual tour through the main things to see in the city. And I will also do it in the order in which you would most likely encounter these different parts of the city as well. First of all, I always like to orient people uh, in terms of where things are and of course, Ephesus is on the west coast of Turkey, so in the eastern part of the Mediterranean. And the eastern part of the Mediterranean in the Roman period was a very rich part of the empire. Remember that um, ancient Egypt and the Middle East and all of what is now Turkey, which is called Asia Minor, was under Roman control. And of course, it was not that far from the ancient Greek city of Byzantium, which during the time that Ephesus was a major city, it had not yet reached its apogee and would become later on in the fourth century, of course, Constantinople. The point is, is that it was at the center of maritime trade routes, and it really gained a lot of its wealth through trade and uh, through its port. Looking a little bit more closely into the Aegean Sea, most people visit Ephesus by going on a cruise. Uh, through the Aegean, which might include Crete and other uh, archaeological, uh, Greco-Roman archaeological sites in the Aegean. And as you can see, it's, uh, there's a port that is near Ephesus. It's um, called Kujadasi, and many of these cruise ships come in and moor at Kujadasi and then take a short bus ride to see Ephesus. Zooming in even closer, you can see this very convoluted western coastline of Turkey. Uh, which made it very amenable to, uh, to do ships going along the coast, you know, coastal navigation, lots of islands, lots of sheltered, sheltered ports, and so on. This may be a map that orients you a little bit better in terms of the modern state of Turkey. So here's a map that shows the modern country of Turkey <clears throat> and its and Ephesus's relationship to, to that. Okay, now let's take a look at the site itself. It's quite a large site. It's not just a couple of buildings, but um, it's a fairly large parts of the city have been excavated. And this is one of the things that makes it like Pompeii or like Ostia in Italy. Uh, these two places really capture our imagination because as you walk through the streets of these, these well-preserved streets, and these well-preserved buildings, you really do get a sense of of what life was like in these ancient cities. And this is, this is one of the things that Ephesus really, really can do for you, is give you a sense of the monumental architecture, uh, especially. All right, now I've put around a red rectangle around the main section. Usually when people go and visit Ephesus, pretty much everything they see is in this rectangle. It takes a two and a half, three hours just to see to just to see this section. So, so you know, sometimes people can go beyond. I will show you if if you have a lot of energy and you've seen all these things. I'll I will tell you a couple of other things that you can possibly take a look at. Um, here's another map. This one is a somewhat older map, but I like it because it has the the list and the numbers, so you can you can find these things. Basically, people start at number 24. This is one of the ancient gates of the city, the Magnesian Gate. This is, this is near where the modern entrance uh, to, the, uh, to the site is. So what you do is you generally walk in this direction um, towards the west, and this street, this is called Koretsi Street, or it's usually called just the Marble Street, is one of the, the main street of the city. And you walk by such monuments as the Temple of Hadrian and the, uh, the Odeon. And at the very foot of it, that's downhill, by the way, moving from right to left is a little bit downhill. You have um, at number 12, the Library of Celsus, which is, of course, one of the main uh, things to see. Then the second section takes you to number nine, which is the magnificent theater. Then you can also walk around this section, which includes the um, Harbor Gymnasium. There's also a bath complex very close uh, to there. And, and also this is, this is a place where you can see old stores and old storehouses that were, that were situated near the port, which is at number seven, the ancient harbor at number seven, now silted up. I'll talk more about that in a second. 
Uh, now, if you have more energy, you can always walk up to the stadium, which is pretty interesting to see, actually. It's not very well preserved, but it's pretty decently preserved, and it's certainly one of the main entertainment buildings of the city. All right, but there again, there's that section in there. This is an older map that doesn't show the excavations of, um, of, the, uh, of, the, of the houses, and this was all done in, in the, the 2000s, and I'll talk about more about this in a second. Now, um, this is another way of, of looking at it to orient you because, of course, the other maps that I show you didn't really show you the terrain. As you see, there is kind of like a two hump mountain, two, two kind of hillsides. And the city is founded by main roads that um, along main roads that are at the bases of these hillsides. So, for example, you enter from you enter from the left hand side. You'll notice the Odeon, that's quite a, a, a visible marker. And as you walk down the Marble Street, you'll see various, various other structures. And then you'll come to this place, you see where it says Temple of Hadrian, and you see this big white patch. This white patch is the roof in the center, lower center. These are the, the roof over the hillside houses. Absolutely magnificent and definitely worth seeing. Um, I'm not sure how they're working the ticketing now, but if you buy your ticket and they ask you, do you want to include the hillside homes? Absolutely say yes. This is one of the major things to see and one of the most fascinating things to see. This is also the area where you find the Library of Celsus. It's where you find the toilets. It's, you find the entrance to the, uh, to the Agora, which is the large rectangle, or large sort of square section in the lower left. And of course, the theater, which is also visible pretty clearly in this image. All right, so Odeon right there. Um, there's the cent There's the sort of, if there's a center of town, it's the sort of angle of the meeting of these two main streets right there. And of course, the theater right there. And there's the stadium, just to let you know. It's not, it, it's not very far away. It's, it's about you know, 300, 300 yards away, 300 meters away. Uh, so if you do have the energy, it is nice to be. A lot of that depends, of course, on the weather. If it's really, really hot, um, then um, then maybe people are willing to take a break. Now, take a look at this aerial photograph. <clears throat> now, at one point, this city was right on the coastline. Now, do you see this this sort of dark thing right in the center that kind of looks like a, a spatula? All right. Now, that is the section of the ancient harbor. So. And the lower left there, in the lower right, sorry, I've shown you the, that kind of basic walk, that kind of L-shaped walk that you take. Well, that is part of the ancient harbor. And that more or less circular section on the right section is the silt of that harbor. Nowadays, when you go down there, it's just a marshy depression. Um, but in ancient times, the shoreline was much, much closer than it is now. And that harbor was connected by the long handle of the spatula to uh, the Aegean Sea. But this gives you an idea. This is the river that you can see the meanders of the river. And the upper left, this is the Kuchuk Menderes, or the small Menderes River. And you can see what, in the past 2,000 years, what kind of silting it has, silt it has, it has brought down over the centuries. And, and thus, this is one of the reasons why Ephesus ceased to be an important city. Uh, around the 5th or 6th century AD, um, partly because its harbor silted up and it was no longer a viable uh, commercial port. So this gives you an idea of how that, um, how that port was connected uh, ultimately to the, to the Aegean. Now, this is not a very good picture. I realize that it's um, also an older picture, but I wanted to show it to you to uh, give you the idea of um, the relationship between these things. The Odeon is in the lower right. The Marble Street leads you to that big white patch, which are the terrace houses. Again, that's the real center. And then you kind of make a right-hand turn, takes you up to the theater, and also that, that walkway uh, around which there were lots of shops that leads to the depression uh, that used to be the harbor of the city. Okay, so this gives you a little bit of an idea. Hadrian's Temple, that's actually, uh, that arrow should be a little bit more to the left, sorry. Um, the brothel, the terrace houses, public toilet, 
sites and, and so on there. The Library of Celsus also in that area, the Agora, the Marketplace, and the theater. Okay, so that should give me a good orientation for you. Uh, here's a more clear a clear map. I'm not going to go around. I'm not going to kind of talk too much about these because I. But I did like to. I did want to include this. Um, I will give you a PDF of this particular lecture so that you'll be able to refer to this. Uh, I just like the fact that this was a kind of graphically very clear, and it did. It does include some things that aren't included in the previous uh, maps that I gave. you. Well, the odeon. Um, now that's a, that's a Greek word that we should really be familiar with. An odeon is uh, is like a theater, except it's very small. And one of the things that that defines it is that an odeon also had a wooden roof. In other words, a, an odeon was an indoor theatrical space, whereas a theater was larger and was an outdoor theatrical space. Theatrical performances could happen in either of them. Of course, the Odeon would be used more in the winter. Uh, very often, the Odeon of a Greco-Roman town also served another function. It was also sometimes the city hall or the boulotirion of the city. And so it had a kind of mul multi multiple purposes. It could be the place where city council met. It could be a place where other civic meetings took place or it could be a place where music or other types of entertainment could take place. As I say, it didn't depend on the weather because um, it was shielded from both the sun and the rain and other inclement weather by its roof. And that's, of course, the wooden roof is the thing that's kind of missing from this picture. This gives you an idea of the plan of the Odeon, and you can see pretty, you know, right away that really it does have a similar type of plan as a Roman theater. But again, the big difference is scale. You can see in this picture that um, you know it's good to have. It's sometimes I do like having people in my pictures. Sometimes I don't like having people in my pictures. But I love this one. This is uh, one time I was at Ephesus during the springtime, and everything was green, and the wildflowers were out, and the fennel was blooming yellow in the distance. You can see parts of the yellow flowers of the fennel um, in the background. And, but it's good having these people here to give you an idea of scale because in, in a few slides from now, I'll also show you an image of images of the theater and you'll get a, an idea of the very different scale of the theater. Well, one of the things that you see fairly soon on as you're walking after, after you see the Odeon, on your right hand side, you will also see this small temple of Hadrian. Uh, so the emperor Hadrian um, had this little temple built and there's a picture of it right there. It's a, it, it's a kind of a frontal temple. It only has kind of one entrance to the street. You can see these pedestals out front, four pedestals, probably each of which had statues on top of them. And it's a beautiful work of architecture. Of course, it's been restored. Archaeologists found only fragments of the sculpture and the architectural sections on the ground, but they have reconstructed it um, to the best of their abilities. And it's really quite extraordinary. You can look at the details of the architectural sculpture. So there's another view of it. And um, not only is the sculpture on the Temple of Hadrian um, kind of non-figural or decorative sculpture, but there's also quite a bit of figural sculpture. Uh, for example, when you look directly at it, and hopefully you'll be there on a nice sunny day like this, that, that gives you the idea of what all of these things look like. You can see in this sort of half moon or this, this half moon type shape above the main square or rectangular doorway into the temple. At the very back of that temple, by the way, there would have been a cult statue of, uh, of, of Hadrian. And you can see this um, kind of fertility uh, figure. This figure reaches out and you can see that there's um, vine scrolls kind of coming out from, from the bottom. Uh, so if you take a look at this, there's a close -up, closer view of that particular fertility figure right there. Okay. And this picture, it's a little bit blurry, but um, it was kind of shooting into the sun, uh, kind of a, a beautiful figurehead in the keystone of, of of the uh, of the arch on the outside, and also a lot of this beautiful floral uh, and leaf um, 
moldings and things like that. So, so bring your bring your telephoto lens if you have it, because it's really great for getting these kinds of details. Now, when you enter the forecourt of the temple, you will look up and see a lot of sculptures. Now, these sculptures are not the original sculptures. So um, what, what they show are processions of gods and goddesses and deities which are protective or apotropaic. They're kind of protecting the outside of the temple. And so here, see this group right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the original sculptures, which are in the archaeological museum in Selchuk, which is the town that is near, um, you know, near the site of Ephesus. And if you do get a chance to include in your visit, um, a visit to the Archaeological Museum, I, I do encourage you to do so because many of the important artifacts that were found there are um, on display. And so here, there, there are, here are the originals of those sculptures right there. And I'll show you a couple of other. These are, this is, for example, shows a sacrifice scene on the left-hand side. You can see this kind of figure on an altar. You can also see the figure of Heracles or Hercules. He's a little bit damaged, but you can see he's muscular and he's got the skin of the Nemean lion over his shoulder. Uh, and also, of course, his signature weapon, which is the club, uh, although the club and his uh, and his arm are kind of kind of broken off there. OK, now, as you walk down this street, the Curete Street, or again, just kind of a marble street, um, what will come into view is the facade of the Library of Celsus. Now, Celsus was a citizen of Ephesus who not only built a library for the city, but this library was also to be his mausoleum. So there is a funerary aspect to this building as well. And you can see that he situated it in a very, well, I don't know, a very prominent location. You can see this building coming at you. Now, of course, it did not survive 2,000 years looking like this. Um, in the, starting in the 1970s, uh, the Austrians, Austrian Archaeological Survey, began a, a multi-decade restoration of the facade of the Library of Celsus. You'll notice that it's just a facade. You don't really get a sense of what the physical building looked like behind, but there was a building. Of course, this is the building that held all the scrolls and the, um, and the books in, of the library. But this is, uh, as I say, this is a reconstruction uh, done by the Austrian archaeologists uh, many, many decades ago. But they did a absolutely magnificent job um, taking all of the puzzle pieces and putting them back together. Now, I also wanted to show you a series of sculptures that are in the museum because um, that street that I just showed you would have been lined on either side by full length sculptures. Uh, these have all been taken away and um, put in the, for safekeeping for obvious reasons, into the museum. So I'll just give you an idea. And if you, if you, when you go, when you walk down this street, you know, you kind of have to, imagine them being there, right? Uh, and it gives you a sense of the kind of splendor of the decoration and all of these wonderful gods and goddesses and, and figures. This is, of course, Aphrodite on, on the very far left over there. Now, there are some cases of some sculpture that have been left on the site. For example, this is a fragment here of a Nike figure, Nike, like the running shoes, which of course is Greek for victory. So this is a winged victory. And you'll see that, that in the victory figure's right hand, she holds a, uh, a palm branch, which is a palm, palm branch, was given to victors, and also a laurel wreath in her other hand. So she holds both of the prizes that were given to those who were victorious, and, and that included you know, that included charioteers who were who were victorious in a chariot race or emperors who were victorious in battle. These two emblems were given uh, to indicate their triumph. And there's a, another view of that of that figure. 
Now, this picture was taken from the facade of the Library of Celsus, looking back up the street, the Coretti Street or the Great Marble Street. Uh, all of those people who are kind of gathered there are, are pretty near the public toilets. I'll show you a big picture of that momentarily. Just to the right, you see um, there is an entrance to the terrace houses, which are all covered up. But, you know, this is, that is to say they have a roof over them. But as I say, if you get a chance to visit them, definitely do that. Um, with, if you're with a guide, they most certainly will point out this. This is a kind of a famous um, inscription into the into the pavement of the marble pavement of the street, a foot that, that uh, indicates the direction to the brothel kind of advertising. And there's a view of the public toilets, also restored, but restored very accurately. Enough of it survived. You'll notice that, I mean, it's pretty easy to see where you sit, right, <laughs> for the restrooms. But you'll notice that just in front of your feet, you'll see that there is a little channel. And through this channel, there was a running water. And the way that you, you know, did this is that you, there was a sponge with on a stick. And you wet the sponge and, you know, you basically wiped your bottom <laughs> and then put the stick back in a bucket. Hopefully that had some kind of sanitizing liquid in it. Something, but um, this channel in front of you provided the water for, for washing up, and uh, it's something that, that, that sometimes people miss. Now, the toilets here, by the way, also were continuously flushing, and I stuck my arm down um, <laughs> one of the toilets with my camera and took this picture. Don't if you if you do this, don't drop your your expensive cell phone or your camera because it, you may have trouble getting. Uh, and basically, water was channeled through the city's aqueduct through here, so it was continuous, continuously running. And of course, it, it took it out to the sea eventually. So there was this continuous flushing of the sewage from the public toilets. I always like these things. So you get this water kind of moving through there. Now, I mentioned the terrace houses, which have this kind of white roofing over them. It is one of the most spectacular things. Now, I'm, many of you maybe have been to sites like Herculaneum or Pompeii. This is, in terms of the state of preservation and the conservation done on mosaics and frescoes, this is better than that. Um, it, it's really quite extraordinary, and you should probably give about at le you know at least forty minutes for visiting here. They they there's a, a kind of walkways all about, so you can get a good view of all these things and take your pictures from the walkways without ever touching or walking on the actual site itself. So it's very very well done. So and so this is where this is this is where the wealthy people of Ephesus lived. Now, these are two pictures on the upper left-hand side. You'll notice that um, um, in this one, only one section has been excavated. But on the one four years later, you'll see that they have built the roof because once they started excavating and finding what they had and how fragile what they had was and how valuable it was, they said, OK, we have to put a roof over this thing because we can't afford to have sunlight or rain or anything like this touch these these frescoes and these walls. So to their credit, the, archaeo the Turkish archaeologists built this very good roofing system that protected the site of the terrace houses. Um, this is a picture I took of, of the um, a diagram of those excavated houses. And you'll notice that they, they, it, when you when you look at it without the colors, you really don't have much of an idea of one house as being separate from the next. But this is why this picture is so useful, because it, it shows you that there's one, two, three, four, five, six different homes. But one of the homes, uh, uh, sorry, seven different homes. But the two top ones, which of course are also at the highest point in the, in, in the, on the hill, and thus had the nicest views, <laughs> are also the largest ones. And uh, well, this is what we would figure, right? This is what we would assume. Um, anyway. Okay, so these are the kinds of things that you'll see. Now, I took these pictures probably in, I don't know, 2014 or so. So there could be even more reconstruction. There could be more. I mean, look at this. Look at the details. For example, on the far left-hand side, uh, in the middle, you can see a wellhead. 
Um, you can also see reconstructed the fantastic marble table on the left hand side, lots of column bases. It's very, uh, lots of frescoes on the wall, but they're still working on putting these frescoes back together. Um, for example, here's another picture I took at the, during that same time, and you can see the scaffolding there. You know, they're obviously ready to do more work. Um, yes, look at these frescoes, look at these mosaics, really fantastic. So definitely worth seeing, um, and I, I love the job that they've done in terms of you know, so you can you notice that the column on the right hand side, obviously it fell down. These columns were all found buried, you know, lying on their side. And some of them had shattered like the one on the right hand side. But they have managed to kind of concrete concrete them back pieces back together again and re erect them to give you a much better sense of what the you know how these things work. This, by the way, you see the diamond shaped pattern, the checkerboard pattern. That, that is surrounded by these columns. This is in this is an impluvium. In other words, this is this is where rainwater would come in. The, there was no roof over it, right? It was just an opening. So the rain would come in through the top. And you'll notice that in this checker black and white checkerboard area, do you notice on the upper right hand corner there is a drain? And so and th there are little channels around the sides of this little courtyard. So rainwater would be sluiced in from the from the slanting roofs, would fall into the courtyard, trickle into the grooves, and then run into a little cistern, which was underneath, for storing water. And then do you see the circular object in the center? That's the wellhead that leads to the cistern. So these there's lots of interesting things that you can learn about Roman houses by going through the terrace houses at F. Um, it's very likely that you will also see some of the archaeologists at work putting together the frescoes that they found on on the ground. And um, so, you know, none of these frescoes were in perfect condition when they were found. They were all found kind of fallen down. And, and it's wonderful how they put these puzzle pieces back together again. And there's the result. Just absolutely fantastic stuff. And by the way, upper right hand corner, these are the catwalks, the metal catwalks that I was mentioning to you earlier. Uh, they're really well done. You can you can see everything, but again, you're not coming in contact with the archaeological site itself or the materials of the site. But it's a, it's a really good option. And here's some details of the wall decorations of the frescoes. And here's one of the black and white mosaics. There are also some figural mosaics. So there's a beautiful one showing a lion, for example. So you can see all these different things as well. Now, the Library of Celsus, uh, let me take a look at some of the details. Um, first of all, you'll notice that at the very bottom, it's a little bit hard to see in this picture, but there are life-size sculptures, which are of Basically, they're allegorical sculptures, like, for example, one of the sculptures shows wisdom, which would be an appropriate allegorical figure for a library, right? Because, you know, a library is a, is a place of repository of wisdom. By the way, do you notice on the right hand side, there is also that arched gate. Now, that is the the gate to the Agora. After the Austrian archaeologists had restored the library of Celsus, they then turned their um, their attentions to uh, reconstructing this gate. So this is also something we can thank the Austrian archaeologists um, uh, for doing because they also um, reconstructed this south gate of the Agora. Well, this is what the or this is what the building looked like in plan. Now remember, pretty much only the facade has been reconstructed. This was also where Celsus was going to be buried. Again, remember I mentioned it was his mausoleum. So this, this diagram gives you a little bit better sense of what the whole building uh, looked like. You can still go back here and look at this section, um, but, um, yeah, but of course the elevation has not been restored. But here's a drawing that gives you an idea of what the original thing looked like. Now, um, I'm not sure if they still let you climb up here. There, <laughs> I heard from somebody that they, they, they've kind of blocked this off, but it, it is nice if you can go up there. And the reason for this is because it's great to look at some of the details of the sculpture. From a distance, it doesn't look like there's a lot of sculpture on it, but, but when you get close, you realize that there's lots and lots of detailed sculpture. So here's another, here's a 
how did I get this picture? Oh yes, yeah, I was actually quite far away and I used my telephoto lens to get this. Um, this is a view that is otherwise pretty hard to get. Now these are some of the details that you can see. Now, some of the pieces are original and some of the pieces are reconstruction. So for example, you see this little arch section up at the very top. Well, the white part is the original marble, but the brown part that looks very new, that is a reconstructed section. So when you're looking at these sections, sometimes you have to kind of go, mm, okay, there are parts that are uh, reconstructed to help us imagine what the whole thing looked like. And I like this picture too, because it shows all of these little coffers, all of these little um, um, kind of corbels, all of this different type of decoration. And I will talk a little bit about about um, uh, this type of uh, what are called what are called moldings in a. You'll notice that there's also uh, inscriptions, um, lots of leaf figures uh, here. Now here's a detail of some moldings. So let me just give you a very quick quick um, uh, lesson. Uh, well, no, let me do, let me wait. Let me do that for another uh, on another slide. So there's one of the allegorical figures right there. There's another one right there, Sophia. That's the one I mentioned before. Wisdom, Sophia, I mean wisdom. Um, and here's a great shot that's taken straight up to see all that coffering uh, and all the details of that. Now, yeah, so that's dental molding. You see, it looks like teeth, so dental molding. That, that one's the easy one to remember. But here's the one. This is the one I wanted to use. So. For, uh, there's also, of course, Greek inscriptions, but do you see this uh, molding here? Okay, so those are acanthus, acanthus leaves. So you've got palmette leaves and you've got acanthus leaves, and this is one of the types of molding. And there's another type of molding that's called ovolo molding, or sometimes it's just called egg and dart molding. So you've got an egg, then you've got a dart, then you've got an egg, then you've got a dart. So that one's pretty easy to remember. And then another very common classical Greco Roman classical molding is called bead and reel. So the bead is the more circular one, and then the reel is the, like the two discs. Uh, so you've got bead, two disc, two, two, two disc reel, bead and reel, bead and reel. That's what, that's what that kind of molding is. Anyway, this gives you an idea of some of that decoration. Um, and there's another bead and reel down there. Okay, let's move on to the theater. The theater is, as I, I you can, Yes, this is not a picture of mine. This is a picture I took from a postcard, I believe. Um, I didn't have a drone. You're not allowed to bring your drone there. And remember, I mentioned to you the idea of scale. Well, this is pretty amazing. Um, um, the, most of the seating area of this theater is built physically into the hillside. But you'll notice that the ends closest to us, there's actually these, these arches that are built up to support the seating. And those are, those are the parts of the theater that were also, because they were constructed rather than built into the hillside, these are the parts that were also, how should I say, a little bit more susceptible to damage because of earthquakes or other seismic activity or just the wear and tear of, of weathering. So this is why these sections you'll see are a little bit more ruined. Now, do you notice that where the people are in the orchestra, the semicircular section at the bottom of the seating area, that just to this side of them, there is a kind of a complicated building complex. Now, this was basically what's called the scene fronds or the scene building. This would have been much, much taller than it is now. Um, and it would have created a kind of scenic backdrop. Um, at the very least, it probably went up to half the height of the seating area of the theater itself. In many Roman theaters, the Scania fronds would go up to the full height of the seating area. Uh, but in the case of, but in the case of um, Ephesus, that was probably not the case. So here's another view. Now, do you see, look at the people in the orchestra again, and to the left of them, you'll see a lot of columns, all right? Now, what did these columns support? These columns supported a timber stage. This is where the actors would be. So the, in the Roman theater, you actually had a wooden stage and the actors would, and this was not so, by the way, in Greek theater, the, in the Greek theater, the orchestra, which was totally circular and did not involve a scene building in the back, all of the action took place in the orchestra. 
So there's kind of a functional and technical architect architectural difference between a Greek theater and a Roman theater. And here's the view of the plan, just to give you a sense of the organization. Again, you see this little kind of dots, right? They're, they're in rows of three um, on the lower part, below the semicircular orchestra. These are the columns that held up this, the wooden stage. And here's a view from up top and looking down into the orchestra and the ruins of the scene building. Now you'll notice that there are a lot of people walking on this other road uh, on the upper right, and this is the road that um, led to the harbor. And it's well worth going along here because these, this road was lined with shops, so you can see all kinds of things scratched into the um, into the marble paving. Like for example, you can see these sort of hash marks that were used for measuring, right? I mean, you know, so this, this so a certain a certain um, how should I put it? Uh, somebody who was selling something, and they they actually had the measuring the me the consistent measuring uh, units down uh, that they'd scraped on the outside of their shop on the street, so people could get an idea that they were getting consistent measures of things. Here's another view of the of the orchestra, and it is quite possible that the theater was also used as a water collection site. You'll notice that around the edge of the orchestra, there is a kind of a channel. And as you can imagine, when it rained, you can imagine that, 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 that this became like waterfalls along the, along the steps. And it would, it would, its semicircular shape and its steep sides would mean that the, the water drain, it could collect amazing amounts of water. So here too, theaters and amphitheaters and stadia in the ancient world were often used to collect water, which we would be directed to a civic cistern, and you know, used for times when the um, when when freshmen, you know, during the dry season in the summer. And here's a uh, here's a here's a diagram. This is a sort of a generic diagram, but it gives you a sense of of um, how a Roman theater was organized. Now, just to show you, this is kind of this is an old picture, but it's um, useful. This is probably the best preserved Roman theater in the world. It's also in Turkey, by the way. It's in a place called Espendos, which is on the south coast of Turkey. And in this case, this is really the only one, except for maybe the one, there's one in Orange in southern France, that survives where the scene building, the backdrop, survives to its full height. Remember, I mentioned to you that the scene building, um, it, it, in, in most cases, was the same height as the seating area. And in this particular theater, you can see that. So back to another picture of uh, Ephesus right there. Pretty beautiful, pretty marvelous place. Now, let's move on. Let's go take a look at some other things. Um, so for example, I just wanted to show you that where the harbor comes in. and just below six and five on this map. This is that road that you could see extending from the theater. Now, let's consider, let's say you've seen all these things and you still have some energy. Well, you might wanna to go to the stadium. Um, now, I'm gonna also show you 28. This is where the temple of Artemis was. I have to tell you the truth. It's not really worth going there now. It's sort of marshy. <clears throat> um, um, you know, so there's not really much to see, unfortunately, but I will show you what there is left. Now, the stadium is pretty overgrown. I suspect that if you went there today, you'd still find it fairly overgrown. Um, and, but you can, you can still see the outlines of the stadium. By the way, stadium, a stade was a unit of measure in the Greek world. And if I remember correctly, it's sort of about 180 meters, something like that. Now, what happened in a stadium? In a stadium, you had foot races. So they were all about sprinting. Um, you started up the upper right and you raced to the in the other in the other direction. <clears throat> so it had a fair it was a very large building, but it had fairly limited function, right? Um, it, it, it wasn't multifunctional, maybe the way an amphitheater was. Anyway, the ancient Romans loved their entertainment. Odeons, amphitheaters uh, for gladiatorial contests, stadiums for foot races, uh, theaters for, mm, well, for theatrical productions, and sometimes other things as well. 
I wanted to throw this in. It's a beautiful print from the 19th century, which shows the it shows the stadium at Ephesus in perhaps better condition than we see it today. Now, just to kind of throw this in to give you a better sense of of how you might imagine the stadium at Ephesus, also in Turkey, also kind of on the west coast, although not inland a little bit. There's a Roman site called Ephesus, or sorry, uh, Aphrodisias. Pardon me. And the stadium in Aphrodisias is fairly well preserved, as you can see. It's, I, I can't really think of a better preserved Roman stadium, to tell you the truth. So here again, you can see these two people giving you a sense of scale in the stadium as well. So when you're at the stadium at Ephesus, try to imagine this one to get a sense of what its um, total visual effect would have been. There's also, yeah, this is a, an aerial view that I got off the internet also from the stadium at, at Aphrodisias. Now, this is a computer reconstruction. This is a reconstruction here of the Temple of Artemis or the Temple of Diana at Ephesus. At one point, it was probably the largest temple in the world. It was an Ionic temple, which if you look at the tops of the columns, you can see that sort of volute capitals. And of course, this particular area of Turkey used to be called Ionia. So this is the Ionian coast of, of ancient, the ancient Greek world. And here's an artist's reconstruction of what the temple looked like. It was, it was absolutely gargantuan. Um, uh, and these computer reconstructions are, of course, to a degree, they are, um, you know, kind of made up. But, but there's, 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 they're based on archaeological evidence to some degree as well. This is what the plan of the temple was looked like. And you can see the number of, not only were the columns enormous, there was an enormous number of them. Um, what was the function of this temple? Well, the, te the function of this temple was to house a cult statue of the goddess Artemis, or as the Romans called her, uh, Diana. And um, this is kind of a useful thing here, too. It shows you the different orders and different sections of, of the temple. Um, and what did this cult statue look like? Well, the original one does not survive, but there are many smaller models of the cult statue that do survive. So we get a pretty good idea of what it looked like. Now, in the Greek East, the figure of Artemis and Diana of the Ephesians was also related to a kind of earlier goddess called sort of the mistress of the animals. So you notice that on her lower part of her body, where the legs are, that there are these different animals that kind of worship her. There's been many interpretations about these sort of things that look like multiple breasts on her <laughs> on her chest. Um, so some people have have interpreted them as 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 human breasts. Other people have in you know and so fertility, all of this kind of thing. Other people have thought that they were bull's testicles or you know seeds or fruits or something like that. But but uh, one of the things that all of the interpretations do seem to be consistent with is this idea that she was a that she was a fertility goddess that not only the fertility of the land but also that is to say agricultural fertility but also the fertility of animals as well that is to say livestock and generally the economic fertility of the city. Here's a reconstructed um, capital from the temple which is in the museum in Selchuk. And this is all that's left of the temple. It's kind of, a, a, you know, you might see if you're there in the springtime, you might see a couple of storks there. You can see the storks around the um, around that kind of marshy area. Uh, one reconstructed capital, and if you're lucky, you go down there and you can you can see a stork's nest on top and a couple of storks there. In the distance, by the way, there's a um, uh, there's the citadel of Selchuk, which is uh, from the I believe this is 12th century. Uh, 12th century Celtic uh, um, period uh, fortification, originally Byzantine, but later taken over by the Celtic. Now, if you want to get a sense of if this fits into your itinerary, if you want to get a sense of maybe what the temple looked like, or a better sense of what the temple looked like, there is a temple of Apollo in a place called Didyma. Um, it's not 
too far away from from Ephesus, but it I mean it's hard to fit. Let's put it this way: it's it's pretty hard to fit both of them in the same day. So you might need an extra day to see this. But the Temple of Apollo at Didyma, uh, really m much more of it survives. And if you want to get, even though it what it is certainly smaller than the Temple of Artemis at uh, Ephesus, it does give you a better sense since so little of that of that of the Ephesian Temple. Uh, Didyma might be a good add-on if you wanted to visit uh, visit this place as well. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, I appreciate your attention, and I hope you enjoy your visit to Ephesus.